Hi, this is Mike Torsha, and welcome to Live Well and Thrive. I have a very special guest today, Chuck Zito. Hey. Thank you for coming on hey, today. Thank you for having me. Uh, we've known each other for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, uh, you probably don't even remember, I met you at the China Club in New York City when Paulie Harmon was yeah. managing a place. And uh, you had your colors, this is when you were with the Hells Angels. And you always wore that long leather My long coat. long duster, yeah. Yeah, I love that, man. That was so cool. <laughs> but uh, your reputation has preceded you. <laughs> Everybody hears stories about you, but I've said I've witnessed those <laughs> situations. A few. A few. <laughs> I remember when we went to, um, you were bodyguarding J.C. Lee's, uh, Stan Lee's daughter. Yes, yes. And we went to... Um, um, Comic Con. Comic Con. Right? Yeah. And we were walking around, but we didn't have the badges to show that we were with the, one of the boots. Right, right. And then this little uh, security guard came over and he's giving us a hard time. And he said, if we don't go get our badges, he's going to throw us out. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. I remember you just like looked at him and said, I don't think that's a good idea because it won't end well. And he kept following <laughs> us. And then he said he was going to call his, his boss. And you said, you can call anybody you want. <laughs> and sure enough, the sea guys come over, and then they saw it was you. Yeah. And the guy said, leave him alone. <laughs> and then we went over to- Leave him alone, he's got a free reign to do whatever he yeah, wants. Yeah, no. We, and you had that shirt that said, uh, I'm responsible for more blackouts than Con Edison. That's right. <laughs> which That's I right. believe you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then we were, we went to see that uh, like replacement show from Sons of Anarchy. What were those guys? The, the the Mexican guys that did the uh, biker show. Oh, the Mayans? The Mayans. Mayans. And we walk over to where the Mayans speaking. They're all saying hello to you. Yeah. And the crowd of people were turned looking to talk yeah. to you. Then the Mayans no, up no, on the that, stage. No, that was, that was the uh, Sons of Anarchy guys. Yeah. Not, because I never was involved with the uh, Mayans. Oh, that's right. They were, Mayans. Oh, yeah. they, were the, they were the second show. Oh, the second, It was yeah. all, everybody, you know, uh, Charlie Hunnam and everybody. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Kim Coates and everybody was up on a stage doing, you know, Q&A. Yeah. So. But as soon as you walked in, they stopped talking. Yeah. And they started, hey, Jack. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was good. So, I mean, you were like Elvis Presley walking through the comic Con. <laughs> it was Elvis, so. Elvis, TCB, <laughs> TCB. <laughs> hey, and did, didn't you buy that Superman um that it was a likeness of a Superman we were looking at. Remember they had those lifelike um, dolls of superheroes? Yeah, no, I didn't get it that time. I didn't get it. Uh, but you do have a collection though, right? I have a bunch of things, yeah. I have, uh, I actually have uh, the robe. You know, there was only two in the world that uh, Elvis made Muhammad Ali. Wow. So I wound up getting it, you know, because Frank Stallone had it. Oh, Frank no Stallone. Kidding, he, yeah, he, Frank he, he, yeah he's, he sold it to me. Yeah, and I had a a, a a mannequin made look just like Muhammad Ali, and he's wearing a robe like he did at the uh, when he wore it for the fight in Las Vegas against uh, Joe Bugner. Wow! So I always see on on TV ringside yeah. UFC all the top fights. Right next to Dana White, right? Uh, next to Dana. Yeah. Well, Dana's got his own section over there, and I, you know. But I'm I'm leaving tomorrow for uh, the weigh-ins uh, Friday, and uh, of course UFC 300. Wow, UFC 300. I can imagine what a lineup wow. for that one, huh? Yeah. So yeah. now, to go back when everything started, how old were you before you got into martial arts or boxing? Was it because your dad oh, was, I was a professional a teenager. fighter? I mean, my father was a professional fighter, so he taught me at a young age, at five years old, how to how to box. And uh, then I went, you know, I was an amateur. I mean, I did all amateur because I was already married and out of the house at 17, you know? Wow. So uh, I went the amateur circuit all around, you know, in the tri state area and went to Golden Gloves four times in New York City and did that, you know? And then, of course, after seeing Bruce Lee in the Green Hornet, I started taking the martial arts. So I went down to uh, Aaron Banks uh, Karate Studio in New York City, and Mr. Chin was teaching White Crane and Tiger Claw Kung Fu. So I started, that was my first system. Wow. And I went on to uh, Chiquito Jiu-Jitsu, Kamiti Ru Jiu-Jitsu, VR Nest Jiu-Jitsu, and I trained with Enzo Gracie in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So, so you had the I trained, game, you had trained, and trained in eight different styles. And I'm a six-degree black belt in uh, Ishiro Karate. 
So unbelievable. Yeah. Been so around, now, done and roll. So now with all of that, when did you end up first being in the, the Hells Angels? What happened there, I was uh in the Golden Gloves at the time and I was a, uh, a member of uh this uh club called the Chingling Nomads in the Bronx. And the Hells Angel came down to uh, visit us by the name of uh, Big Vinny Girolamo. And uh, I used to wear a uh, a Golden Gloves patch on my side. And he goes, you're in the Golden Gloves? I says, yeah. He goes, my chief's in the Golden Gloves. You know, he trains at Gramercy Gym you know, in New York City. And I was training in, in New Rochelle and White Plains. And uh, I started going down to uh, Gramercy Gym, which was on 14th Street. Uh, right above the old Academy of Music there. And I met Sandy. He was the president of the uh, New York City Hells Angels. He was also a professional boxer. So we started training together. We started boxing each other. And uh, that's how I met met him. Uh, I used to paint cars and, and motorcycles. I wanted to paint his motorcycle. Other Hells Angels saw that. I started painting their bikes. And next thing I knew, I became a Hells Angel. And I was in uh, 1979. Amazing. And I was um, in the club for uh, 25 years. And then in 2004, I quit the club. And uh, wow, thinking about it, it's 20 years ago. So now, I quit. when you quit, did you go through a withdrawal or you were uh, relieved? What was it like after you left them? Because it must have been like a brotherhood. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah it family. was. I mean, uh, it was a big family. And, uh, you know, a lot of these guys were my brothers and all. And, uh, um, I just had other things going on, and uh, it was time to leave. And now I think about it, that was 20 years ago I quit. So, yeah. Because I'd have, uh, you know, 45 years in the club now. So, <laughs> wow. But so now, like, when you went through that transition and now you, you left the club, was that when you really said pursue the acting? Was that when you. Uh, no, no, because uh, you know what? I always say if it wasn't for Sandy Alexander. And Hell's Angels, I would never become an actor because uh, we did a movie, uh, I believe it was 1981, called Dead Ringer with Sharon Meatloaf. And Sandy was one of the uh, uh, stunt coordinators on the show, along with Alex Stevens. And they needed, you know, 18 guys on motorcycles, so he got all the Hell's Angels to do it. Wow. And I caught the stunt bug and I became a stuntman. Wow. I've done 76 movies as a stuntman. And like 78 movies as an actor. So I've been in it quite a while. And but now, Sandy, Sandy actually opened the doors, you know, for me in Hollywood. Because uh, like I said, if I never did the stunt work, I would never become an actor. Amazing. So I always, always, uh, you know, thank Sandy for getting me into uh, the uh, movie business. Now, I know the Hells Angels get a bad rap, but wouldn't you say that, they protect their communities, their neighborhood. Keeps well, I'll tell you safe. what, we lived on East Third Street. We call it East Side Homicide. Uh, it was 77 East Third Street. And for uh, 50 years, it was the safest neighborhood, safest block, I should say, not the neighborhood, but the safest block in the history of New York City. Nobody did a thing there. Nobody stepped out of line because we ruled that, that street with an iron fist. Yeah. Yeah, and all the neighbors were, of course, happy. And, you know, that's back back in the day, in in the 70s, when you're able to leave your uh, doors and windows open and hang out on a, on a stoop outside. Yeah, those were the days. Those don't were the like days that don't happen like anymore. You your car, right? You would leave your car open. because You leave your keys it. in the car, you leave anything. Nobody ever touched anything. You know, and forget if anybody looked day. wrong at your sister, right? Oh, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. Now... Now you see nothing but uh, what what happened. I haven't been in California in a long time. I used to come all the time. Yeah, but I happened to come off the uh, the the, uh, the highway here and took um, uh, sunset down. I couldn't believe what I saw. It was like a third world country, man. I said, "What the hell is going on, man?" They tore down these beautiful, beautiful historical buildings to put retail apartments above. Unbelievable. It's you know what the 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 I, I'm I'm glad I grew up in an era, you know, the '60s, the '70s, the '80s, and even the '90s were good. Once the 2000s came, we went to shit. Ah, hey, come on, we had Studio 54. Remember those days? Oh, forget about it. Yeah, we were just, actually, I'm 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 yeah I'm 
working on my documentary. Yeah. And uh, Paul Herman, of course. Yeah. Uh, he did a great interview for me. So we're now we're putting all the pictures to the stories. And I first met him the first time was at Cafe Central. And he was the maitre d' there, along with Sheila Jaffe. Yeah. Oh, my God. And uh, I was trying to find pictures. Believe it or not, there's no pictures on 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 Google or nothing. Usually, you, have every, you can find everything. No pictures of the uh, place. So I reached out to Peter Herrera, who, who owned you know, st- uh, uh, Cafe Central. And I don't care whether it was a Sunday night, a Friday, Saturday, uh, Wednesday, no matter what, when you went in there, there was always at least 10 celebrities sitting there. Uh, always 10. And uh, I reached out to him to see if he had a picture of the front so I could use it. So he's, he's been, been back and forth for the last couple of days on, uh, you know, we've been texting each other, sure. which is great. And I even spoke to uh, Sheila today. I haven't talked to her in a while. And uh, text uh, Joanne Horowitz also today. Yeah, she's so, doing well. I saw her at Craig's. Yeah. And I saw, she was with yeah. Sheila yes. the other week. Yeah. Actually, they're doing something tonight for a, a, a poly thing. You know, they're getting together with the people from Cafe Central tonight. Oh, I didn't know that. At uh, Cafe. Um, is there a Cafe Amici out here or something? something it's, it's where they had the. Uh, Memorial for Oh yeah, that's at the Amici. Yeah, that, those that, guys that owned uh, Cafe Roma own that. Yeah, it's right on Doheny. Is and, it called Cafe Amici? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so what happened tonight? Uh, but I have a bunch of people meeting me. Yeah, and you know that we're going to go to uh, Rayo's tonight. Yeah, so we're going to get a nice Italian. Uh, yeah, I love course those tonight. Meatballs. Those meatballs are so damn cool. You know, they're known for even one in New York. I go, all I get is clams. Roasted peppers and meatballs. That's what I eat there. Uh, you know? Yeah, I always so. get the meatballs and I, they make this amazing uh, calamari oh, with um, arbiata sauce to die yeah, for I don't with eat some that. rigatoni. I don't I eat that. I just love it. But And then uh, Johnny Roast Beef is there, always there. Johnny Roast Beef. Stories. Yeah. He's so funny. He's done a lot of movies, Johnny. Yeah. It's been a lot of movies. You know? Yeah, he's a good guy. But so now in the documentary, May first, Beverly Hills Film May, Festival. May, May, yes, it's going to be the uh, Beverly Hills uh, Film Festival. It's for a week, from the first to the sixth, or the fifth, something like that. And mine's going to be the uh, first night. The Chinese the Theater, slot. right? Uh, Grumman's Chinese Theater, yes. right on Hollywood. Wow. So it's a it's a big place. Having a big red red carpet and everything, and uh, uh, people. Uh, it's a festival, so people go pay to go see him, you know. But of course, all the people in in, in the uh, movie, of course, not the movie; it's a documentary. Uh, I'll be my guest there. But uh, anybody else who wanted to go see it, it's May first and uh, seven thirty at the Grumman's Chinese Theater. Fantastic. You know, so the uh, red carpet's like seven o'clock. You know, so a lot of people who've in it will be. Except you know, a lot of people moved from California; they moved to Florida. So, you, do? you know, Sly will be in Florida and uh, a bunch of other people. Mark Wahlberg moved to uh, uh, Vegas. Yeah. Vegas. I mean, everybody's everybody's yeah, not jumping town, ship, right? man. But so now, will the documentary, where does it begin in your life? At what point? Are you- oh, it begins since I was born, man. Uh, yeah, wow. Yeah. And it shows when I was, you know, a few weeks old, I was in a bassinet and I had my boxing gloves over it because my father was a professional fighter. You know, in the 30s and the 40s. And, uh, you know, of course, he put the gloves there. Yeah. But uh, he was a great fighter. A lightweight and welterweight. Had 228 fights. Holy shit. You know, back then. The, he looked and he used to fight. I remember the pictures he, you posted. He used to fight two, three times a week. Holy shit. For $10 a fight. How many rounds were they? Uh, they went 10. You know, oh, the championships okay. were 15, but yeah. uh, 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 10 rounds. Um. We talk about the old days when he used to get knocked down and it was considered a round when they went 30, 40 rounds. Yeah. You know, in the Jack Dempsey days. Wow. So, but he was a great fighter. And like I said, he got on his hands and knees, taught me how to box at five years old, you know. So now, that, did that toughness evolve or that was something genetically you'd say you're, you're, you're a tough man? Uh, my father was a tough guy. I mean, I remember in Brooklyn, when we lived in Brooklyn, they said, there's a fight down the street. So me and my friends ran down the street. It was my father. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> my father fighting. You know? so, <laughs> he was good with his hands. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, he was great with his hands. You see. You know, and like I says, never, because a lot of guys, you know, through the years, they can't talk, they can't speak. He always spoke well. He looked good. He had a flat nose, of course, scar tissue over the eyes, yeah. but he was a good looking guy. Yeah. Wow. Like you. So, yeah. Right? You look just like him. When you yeah. put the pictures up, yeah, yeah, you really. Well, I took his, I took his pose. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I had, to, I had that shirt where both of us, you know, alongside each other, yeah. using the same pose. You know, yeah, it was like so, like twins. Yeah, amazing, man. I'm yeah. so excited. I know you've been working on what you said like ten years to do this. Yeah, it had to be because I tell you, Sly is young in it. You know, Sly does a great job too. So, and I'm just waiting for him. Uh, you know, they they started season two, Tulsa King. Yeah. So I'm just waiting to hear from him because I was supposed to, uh, the first season, uh, Freddie Poole called me, the stunt coordinator, and they wanted me to play the main biker. You know, because they knew, of course, you know, who yeah, I was sure. and, you know, motorcycles and everything. And uh, it was uh, like three or four, four episodes. But uh, Sly mentioned to me that, you know, uh, Terrence Winter and all those guys wanted me to play the uh, Kansas City mob boss. So I happened to, uh, you know, text him. I said, look, I says, uh, they want me to play the uh, biker. Should I wait? Am I going to play the uh, Kansas City mob boss? So he wrote me back. I mean, you know, text me back. And he said, uh, look, I'm writing more. I'm producing now. So just hold off. So I know they just started the second season. So I'm just waiting to hear from him to yeah. come in and play the Kansas City mob boss. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I know how he is. He's always writing in the trailer. Yeah, yeah, he's you know? right. No, he's 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 amazing. Yeah, he's such a genius. Here's a guy who did, you know, Rocky, what, 1976. Yeah. And was great. And then Rocky 2 II and 3 and 4 and 5. Yeah. You know, and, and and the same. I mean, he 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 made a franchise between the Rockies and the Rambos and the Expendables, which I was supposed to be actually in the yeah. first one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's amazing how his career at one point had totally dropped. Yeah. Nobody wanted him. And then all of a sudden, he came well, back. Well, I wouldn't say nobody wanted him. I mean, well, he was, yeah. he was a great, he's a great actor. I mean, uh, and like I said, he's he's a fantastic writer. Yeah. To have all these franchises that just went, you know, into season after season and, and, and uh, part after part. You know, one, two, three, four, five. Come on. Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah. he's like he reinvented himself again. Yeah. I mean, yeah. most of the actors are kind of fading away. He's going strong. Yeah. And now he's in that Tulsa King. So everybody loves that. And his Everybody's reality show is doing great with yeah. uh, Jennifer and Frank and the girls. Yeah. 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 You so. know, it's, it's great to get insight what Sly's like, yeah. you know, at home. Yeah, you know, yeah. you always see him kicking ass and shooting people, and right? Yeah, you get yeah. to see him hanging out with the kids and <laughs> yeah. having dinner. You know, it's kind of refreshing to see the other side of Sly. Oh, yeah, of course. And But we yeah. always saw him at Cafe Rome. Remember the lunches we'd have? Uh, the fun conversations. And yeah. that's closed. I know, I know. They're closing everything. I mean, that was a historic place where we used to meet. Well, look at Beverly you know, Hills. Sly and Arnold Schwarzenegger and everybody. Yeah, I mean, Dolph everybody, Lundgren, Dolph Lundgren, everybody was on. there. It was our Saturday spot. It was great, and it was great. A lot of people used to go there. We, we, if you remember, you had to wait online to get a table. Yeah. Then it just died out, and uh, like everything else. But you know, ever since uh, this damn COVID and all those this, the BLE shit that went on, all the stores are boarded up. All the restaurants closed. I, I came. I came. I remember that when they all the bo stores, the whole. The whole uh, Beverly Hills, all uh, Cannon Drive was bored. I couldn't believe yeah. it. I said, wow. That was terrible. You know? And, uh, you know, it just nobody wanted to go out. Now people don't want to even want to wear their watch. The women don't want to wear the jewelry. People don't Not want to wear- Not me. Yeah, I Not me. <laughs> I was just sitting in Beverly Hills like this. Hey, yeah. come and try and take it. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be the biggest mistake of their life, right? They, they, I, they have to have a big gun, I'll tell you that. Uh -huh. But I'll tell you something, having this reputation as this badass, have people intensely tested you? Well, Bob, see? I'm 71 years old and had two street fights in eight months. Wow. Month, my, I, I would probably say four months. But how would happen? Yeah, they just, they just, one was in a restaurant. I was having a great dinner, great, great dessert. 
And one guy started with me. And he was young. He was 38 years old. Jacked. You know, he was. And uh, he found out it was the wrong thing to do. And the other one was I was paying my bill at the Verizon store. <laughs> and a guy started with me there. But what if he started? Guy, he just had an attitude that guy was, with you? You know, that guy was in his 20s and uh, just, yeah. And I'm saying to myself, because you got to realize, you know, I knocked both of them out unconscious. But I got to worry about getting arrested, getting sued, yeah. you know, going to jail, all that stuff. Losing, you know, a lot that I have. So I got to just watch because I, you know, uh, and too old for this I got to ignore it. these people. Not too old. I'm never, never too old. I've said I'm 71. I feel good. <laughs> you know, I train. I go to the gym. I still roll around. I still do everything. I feel good. No, nah, but I meant too old to have to deal with this kind of bullshit and pressure. No. You know what I mean? We're, we've been no, through No, I, I, I got to walk away next time because <laughs> the other side says, just knock them out, man. You know, one says, go this way. The other one says, just knock them out. And that's what I did. No, I remember when there was one time. There was, there was, I think it was a rival uh, biker gang, and you took all five of them outside and knocked them all out. Uh, I was like, so funny. Uh, I watched you knock out five guys. <laughs> and it was so funny to see that. It was like the funniest thing. Because yeah. instead of like all charging you, they just one and one at a time went after you, and you would just bang. Yeah, I mean, I've been in situations before. It's crazy. Yeah. That's what Tony Danza said in my documentary. He goes, uh, the first time I met Chuck Zito, he goes, I was at Studio 54, and I saw this guy over there. He had Hells Angel patch on. He had a long duster, and three guys were messing with him. Chuck knocked all three of them out. And he goes, that's how I met him. <laughs> so, <laughs> a few people. No, but I, I, that way. I won't get into specifics, but yeah. I remember one time someone actually was making fun of you. And us in general, because of our New York Italian accent, what do you want yeah. to call it? And you gave him a chance just to, to stop and go away, and he pushed it. And of course, he was knocked out, and you know, <laughs> not a good thing for him. But you did give him a chance to stop it. Yeah, you didn't like I try. go. You know, I see that you make efforts, but yeah. people for some reason got this thing they want to test you out, which they find yeah. is a big mistake. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, for them, I tried. I know. I try. Like this one guy, the last guy that was in the Verizon, uh, he walked outside and I said, hey, man. I walked outside. And he goes, hey, you ain't so tough. Let's get on. So I walked towards him. And he's running backwards, you know, with his hands up. I said, you know what? Have a good day, man. I got in my car. I started my car up. Next thing, he's banging on my window. I should got to be kidding me. Oh, Jesus Christ. So he learned the hard way, too. <laughs> now, but did he know who you were? He just thought he was being. Oh, yeah. No, no. He knew who I was. He knew who I was, you know. Well, Everybody wants a shot at the title. Yeah, it's all right. yeah. No, but you know what? I, I I see other sides of you too. You're a kind soul. You're a solid friend. You hey, stick up for your friends. I'm the nicest guy I know. <laughs> <laughs> you are. That's why so many people love you. Seriously. You know, I, I'm I'm blessed that I have so many. You know, I have a great family. I have great dear friends, yourself and everybody else, and uh, I have great great fans that. You know, follow me and look up to me, and I'm blessed. So, so you, and uh, what's the next thing after the documentary? You have any other films or things you want to do? Uh, well, I'm working on this uh, TV series called Gravesend. Oh, that's you know, right. With yeah. uh, Willie Willie DeMeo, so he's the writer, the Great producer, show. the uh, director, and also the star of it. And and so many people are in it. He's got so many talented people in it, you know. Yeah, Chaz, Chaz Palmateri and uh, uh, Amon Asante, Andrew Dice Clay, uh, William Forsyth, uh, Fran Dresna, uh, Gina Kashan. Uh, just so many people are in it. It's amazing. And now he's this this uh, season, uh, Shaq's going to be in it. So, oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, Shaq's yeah, a So character, we go man. back in, uh, uh, what's April now? May, June. June, we start. And this takes place in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, it takes place in Brooklyn. Uh, we we shoot in Staten Island because I'm I'm in prison. I play Carmine Rizzo. I'm in jail for life, so they're using a a, a prison in uh, Staten Island that's closed down. So we use that, and uh, we also shoot in uh, um, Palm Beach, Florida, and everything. You know, Fort Lauderdale and all that. So between back and forth, but he's got a lot, a lot of uh, and the thing about it, he lets me do my everything. I write my own stuff. 
I, I do my own fight fight scenes. I, I do all the stunt, you know, choreographing everything for me. And uh, it's just great. It's just uh, he's let me do what I want. That's bro. He's and, he's he's a good guy. Yeah, great. And guy. now there's going to be a lot of uh, prison stuff because, like it says, I'm saying, look, I'm in prison for life. How many times are they going to use me? <laughs> so, I I I looked at the uh, first season, and then I started going flashbacks. I call him right up. I said, "Hey Willie, we got to do a lot of flashbacks to me, man." And we started doing all flashbacks, but now we're going to do all a lot of prison stuff. You know, fights in jail, the way. You know the the uh, all the stuff that goes you know with the prison stuff. So, i and I remember your show Oz. Come on, Oz, greatest you show on great HBO. You were that. That was the best. Greatest show on HBO, man. You know the crazy thing about it. I just got home. I did six years in prison, and my friend uh, Brian Hamill. We went to go see the Don King story, and uh, the projector breaks like fifteen minutes into the film, so they turn the house lights up. Brian introduced me to Tom Fontana, who's a writer and producer of Oz. And also Dean Winters was there. He goes, look, Chuck just got out of prison. He might be good for technical advisor. So uh, Tom goes, he goes, you got a great face. Do you act? And of course, I bullshit. I said, yeah, of course I act. <laughs> and uh, I went down to read and I beat like 40 guys out for the part. It was called, the character's name was called Sam Pancamo. When I got the part, they changed it to Chucky Pancamo. Ah, nice. So I became Chucky Pancamo on the second season and all the way to the uh, sixth season. Yeah. So I was on it, you know. That's great. It was greatest show. We started it all. We started it all before, before Sopranos, before Sex in the City, before Six Feet Under. It was Oz. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't wait every every time it, the, the new episode. I couldn't wait to watch the show. Yeah. Yeah. I told all the Sopranos, "You guys ever come to Oz?" We'd spank you guys. So I used to tell James Gianna Feeney that, everybody. I could have yeah. never put you on The Sopranos, though. What happened? I tried to go on The Sopranos because uh, when ours was over, I even wrote a synopsis for David Chase, how Chucky Van Kama comes out of Oz and he joins the uh, you know, Sopranos with the Jersey mob. And I, I remember I brought it into uh, James Gandolfini's uh, uh, dressing room, and I showed him. And he goes, you know, Chuck, he goes, not for nothing. He goes, a lot of these guys are scared of you. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you're known to beat up actors. I said, look, James, anybody who disrespected me, you know, we took to the next level. So, of course, they disrespect me. We'll go there. But I'm just looking for a job. And... It was where Chucky Pan Combo comes out and he says, and I don't know what it was, David Praval, his character, I don't know what it was, where he, you know, wrote me in prison, hey, you come see us when you get out, you know? So after, you know, doing you know, 10, 15 years or whatever, I come out and I go see Tony Soprano. And at first he goes, who's this guy, Chucky Pan Combo? He goes, I don't know, T, we'll go check him out. Then he comes back, he goes, look, this guy's serious. You know, they sent him. Two guys that go whack him, we sent him home in body bags. So we have a sit down at a, at a restaurant. So it's just me and Gandolfini, the way we are here. And it's, the next table is his whole crew. And he goes, well, how can I help you? I said, well, I says, uh, this guy told me that if I get out, you know, you'd give me a job. He goes, well, I don't know if you know, but he's, he's not around no more. I says, yeah, that's what I heard. But uh, I heard you're the one who, you know, got rid of him. But, you know. That's, that's business. I said, I'm just looking for a job. Then he uh, he was like ignoring me and stuff. And I, says, I went out of the way. I said, hey, who's your favorite actor? And I remember they were on their yacht. And he was just listening to Dean Martin. He goes, Dean Martin. I said, me? James Cagney. I said, you remember that scene in White Heat where Cagney goes, he passes down. Ask him about Mars. How's Ma? How's Ma? She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. And he goes crazy. He jumps on the table, so I bang the table. He ducks down. These guys grab their guns, yeah. and I get up. I said, I expect to see you hear from me in 24 hours. In 24 hours, what they do is they send two guys to whack me. I send them home in body bags to be continued. It would have been a great fit. I know. But uh, David Chase <laughs> said he was insulted because nobody's ever gave him a synopsis for his own show. But that sounded but phenomenal. No. You know, it sounded phenomenal, but you know the life, you know? And uh, 
He never put me on it, man. Never put me on it. So people saying, oh, he never took nobody from, from Oz. That's what he talked about. Edie Falco was a prison guard. That's, yeah, that's And right. she was doing both shows, Oz and, and Sopranos at the same time until they paid her a lot of money and she went to the Sopranos. That's what he talked about. And no, I never did it. Never did yeah, it. He's weird. It would have been a good fit. This one, I, I, I mess you, what I wrote. No, I think what you wrote was brilliant, but I want your opinion. What did you think of the Soprano ending? The Soprano ending? How it ended. In the diner, uh, goes black. Just goes black. Just goes black. Yeah, just ends with. I, I, you know, you just reminded me of it, but. The guy comes in with a member's jacket in the diner. Yeah. Tony looks at him, kind of ignores it, looking at the, the box for the music, goes in there, the restroom. They all join him. Guy, the member's jacket, comes out of the bathroom. Black. Black. Makes you figure out what. What? Did he whack Tony? Did what happened? But, you know, it's retarded. I the, it same was... with, the same with Oz. You know how we ended? No, how did it we end were it? all on a bus. Because the Antrex came into the prison. They put everybody who didn't die on a bus. I'm one of them. Dean Winters. And, and we're in transit off? to nowhere. <laughs> That's why I always told Tom, bring it back. We could we could bring that, yeah. that show back. You know, bring it back that the bus was hijacked or the bus had an accident. He won't guys do it. He escaped. Won't, he won't bring it this. back. I think it'd be a great show. And he tells me, he goes, you know what? Call HBO if they want it, we'll do it. I said, me, call HBO. You're the one who, you know, had a rapport with them. Not that I, I had a great rapport with HBO, you know, when I I went, was involved in it. Yeah. But we could still bring that show back. I think you should bring it back. And finally get off the bus because there's still a lot of guys that still look young. So what if you brought it to Netflix? I don't know. It was an HBO show. I mean, I don't oh, know. They may have the rights. Yeah, they probably have the rights to it. But to bring Oz back? But he, he tells me, well, call HBO. If they want it, we'll do it. I said, you call, not me. Well, he's a writer. You got, he should be you got more. Him. You got more pulling than me. <laughs> no, but at the very end of Soprano. When I was, I was watching this, huh? bring back Oz. That's right. No, but when I was, last question, the fact that they entered it just going black, what the hell was that? I don't know. I don't I, remember that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I that's. I saw it, the last one. Yeah, everybody was like, what? Well, that's crazy. Right? I mean, give that's us. That's crazy. Give us peace of the mind. The same, if you remember, uh, even, even Sons of Anarchy. The last episode, uh, okay. you know, Charlie Hunnam, Jax, is riding into the big tractor trailer, just, and you know he gets hit and gets killed. That but is, we, we don't see that. Yeah. You, so you got to figure, oh, he got hit by the tractor, he's done with. Yeah, then before, there was some some Jack or something on the ground, metaphorically. I was like, what, what is he writing at the end? Was he on drugs when he wrote the end? <laughs> right? I no, I didn't like the ending on that either. He should have he let me write the ending. <laughs> I wrote a good synopsis, man. But he got yeah. pissed off. He goes, nobody on my show <laughs> ever gave me a synopsis to my show that I, you know, write and everything. I, no, but Chuck, you are a great so, writer. I read some so, of your material, man. I, 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 uh, I have a great, great uh script out there it's been out there for the last 30 years you know nobody wanted to put the money up in fact sylvester sloan is the executive producer on it yeah i took it from my book called street justice yeah it's about uh myself who plays a uh, martial arts guy and two cops an older cop and a younger cop and uh they're bringing all the bad guys that's what's happening today and they're out before they even finish their paperwork and yeah. that's happening right now today yeah. and it's more like a vigilante film which would be great today sure it would. it's a cross between love story karate kid death wish billy jack and the godfather roll into one wow it's a great script everybody loves it but nobody wants to put the money up you know and it's not it's a, it's a low budget film if you think about it it's like 10 million dollars it doesn't make sense. That's nothing. Well, you know what? Maybe after the documentary, the yeah, sensational, we'll then they're going to knock on your door. <laughs> yeah. Right? And then you can say, hey, bring back Gaz. Make my movie. Yeah. Right? You know, things change when all of a sudden you're on the top of the hill I again. hope so because uh, 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 everybody's waiting for this uh, documentary and it's a long time coming. And like I says, uh, May 1st at the at the uh, Beverly Hills Film Festival, which they film, you know, they, they show a lot of films. Yeah. But there's a lot of people there from Netflix and you know Lionsgate and everybody. So somebody, somebody's gonna pick it up. 
Oh yeah, it, 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 it's good. I've seen a lot of documentaries lately, and uh, I think mine blows them all away. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure it is because I know you. Because uh, and it's like I said, this is you see me three weeks old in in, in a bassinet with my gloves uh, hanging down. You know, that's great. And uh, when I was you know was born and on Wheeler Avenue in the Bronx, and from there I moved to Barreto Street in Hunts Point, lived over there. Uh, and that's where I was getting beat up every day by a guy named Butch, <laughs> five years old. But he, every time he saw me, he beat me up. That's why I went uh, crying home one day. My father said, don't ever come crying home to me again. And he pulled out his trunk, and he opened it up, and he had all his boxing equipment and his robe, his headgear yeah. and everything. And I remember him taking out the gloves and him getting on his knees and teaching me. That's so, a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so that's you. all in the documentary. Yeah. And, uh, of course, when I was old enough, I was, you know, 16, went to Golden Gloves. And 17, 18, again, went back in. And I've just done so many things in my life, man. So, uh, you know, like I said, I've been, uh, you know, started, I had my own bodyguard business back in the day in the 80s and 90s. I was known as a bodyguard to the stars. Yeah, Priscilla Presley. Bodyguard everybody, everybody, everybody could think of, everybody. So Liza Minnelli was my first client. And from there, I went to, you know, I, was, I became a stuntman, a uh, bodyguard, uh, um, an actor, radio. I have my own radio show on Howard Stern's 101 for uh, six years, Chuck Zito's View. Yeah. I'm an author. I wrote books. I've done so many things in my life. I've done so many things, I think, that'll take another guy five lifetimes to achieve. And one of your closest friends. President of the United States. Yes. Donald Trump. That's right. President Trump. President you were Trump. at Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago. I was in a three three days. Yeah. We had like a dinner and uh, he was great. He's great. Seriously. No one has ever done what you have done. Seriously. Yeah. Your life journey. That's why this is going to be a huge hit because yeah. people don't understand all about you. They know fragments of your yeah. accomplishments. Yes. But when they see how you evolved- now, how you grew? I've had a hell of a journey. And guess what? We're still traveling. <laughs> yeah, I feel, you know, even though I'm 71, I don't look it. I don't feel it. Oh, you look great. I still box. I get in a ring. You look I, you, know, you look like you put on some more muscle, too. You look, you look <laughs> thicker, good. man. I feel good, man. You still eating the, the chocolate cake at Richie's? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I just I just left there. <laughs> I just had some pizza. Yeah, Richie Palmer from Mulberry yeah, Street. Yeah, yeah. Best pizza, but the best chocolate cake, right? They have ch chocolate. They make the chocolate cake. They make vanilla cake. It's great. <laughs> it's just that they don't have coffee there. They don't what? have coffee. I don't what? know why. Are they going to yeah. put up a coffee machine? <laughs> yeah, you should put a coffee machine because a lot of people want coffee and sit Makes down and have sense. cake. Makes sense. You even have the cake. So I have the cake and I have to have a glass of milk, cold milk with it. <laughs> well, that's the best thing, cold and, milk and, with the cake. You know, when I, even when I was hanging out at... You know, in like 1979, hanging at a Cafe Central, I would go in there. They had chocolate cake also. <laughs> so I'd be sitting there with my patch on, my long duster, drinking glass of milk and eating chocolate cake. And people were like, and if you think, if you remember, I, Bruce Willis was the bartender. Yeah, that's right. Bruce Willis was the bartender there. Wow. And it's so funny. And you don't drink. Never drink. You never drank alcohol. Never drank. Never smoked. Never drank. Never took a drug in my life. Never tried it. Wow. And you got to realize I was Hell's Angel for 25 years. Go figure that. Wow. <laughs> so uh, I just never did it. I still don't. Yeah. Well, good so, for you. It's better off you don't. Know, I feel good, man. I feel good. Yeah. yeah I best... see people my age. Well, a lot of guys didn't Have reach made. my age. Yeah. A lot of my friends didn't. Guys died in their, you know, 40s and 50s. And, you know, because they were drinking, they were doing it. They were doing a lot of things. Yeah. So. Uh, that preserved me. That preserved me. Yeah. Was not drinking and smoking and six years in prison also preserved me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, so, well, check done, like I said, I've done so many things, man. You, and you, uh, you have, and we're uh, still going. You are. And I, and I want to thank you for coming on today. Oh, thank you for having me, man. I mean, this was, was awesome, man. I look forward to going out tonight and celebrate with Rayos with the crew. Rayos tonight. Yeah. Rayos tonight, man. Thank you. We got like 10 people uh, tonight, Rayos. That'd be fun. 7.30. And yeah. uh, you're going to join us. I'm going to join you. Promise. Yeah. I want to thank you for watching Live Well and Thrive. We need your support. So please subscribe.
Thanks for watching. Subscribe. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching this episode. Got great news. The merch is ready. You're going to see an array of all kinds of great products. Go to operationfitness.com. If you want to order anything, click on my store. Thanks for your support.